thank you all from, for coming. It's just wonderful to see all of you here. Um, I'm going to read most, most of the poems I read will be from this book, Becoming an Ancestor. This is my latest full-length poetry collection. It came out in 2015. Um, and the poems in it are about ancestors, my contemporary family, and about um, mortality. And it's really about everyone because we are all in the process of becoming ancestors. So I'm going to start out with a, a poem that's a Villanelle, and it's about my mother's figurine collection. Figurines. They seemed old-fashioned when I was a child, as they curtsied above the fireplace. I didn't like them, but my mother was beguiled by the way they cocked their heads and softly smiled in their flowing gowns, ermine muffs, and lace. They seemed old-fashioned when I was a child, with their parasols, bouquets, blue eyes so mild and curls adorning each bone china face. I didn't like them, but my mother was beguiled. I yearned for all things new and free and wild, not dinky doos and Genevieve's prim grace. <laughs> they seemed old-fashioned when I was a child, from their petticoats to how their hair was styled, but now I keep them in an oak-trimmed case in the dining room. My husband's not beguiled <laughs> by the bows and hats and fans I once reviled. In my home, my mother left her trace in figurines old-fashioned to a child. She cherished them, and now I am beguiled. Oh, and um, now uh, I'm going to read a poem about my dad. Uh, and it's called The Man Who Believed in Santa Claus. We always ate lots of popcorn and candy at the movies, defying my mother. On summer weekends, we rode the merry-go-rounds at Tilden Park and the Santa Cruz boardwalk. Once, he threw the ring in the clown's mouth as his wooden horse bobbed up and down, and he demanded a free ride because that was the deal when he was a boy. I had to beg him not to use up all our fireworks before dark on the 4th of July <laughs> and to wait until Christmas to open his presents. I set an example by not opening mine. He made me mad, refusing to admit that Santa wasn't real. I thought he was lying, not wanting me to grow up. But decades later, after my mother died, he kept two Santa dolls on the mantle over the fireplace, year-round. One with a cotton beard winked in his red felt hat, fur-trimmed hat, white boots. The other, a china figurine waving hello with his right hand, spun on a music box that played jingle bells. By the worn chair where Santa's advocate always sat, he kept the New York Sun's 1897 response to Virginia O'Hanlon's question, is there a Santa Claus? Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus, the Sun replied. The things we cannot see are more real than the ones we can, and only fate, poetry, love, and romance can briefly push the veil aside. The man who believed in Santa had congestive heart failure and myasthenia gravis, and his heart fluttered like sheets on a line. We buried his ashes at Mountain View, but when I close my eyes, I see him in his knit cap riding shotgun at Santa's side, <laughs> help, helping steer eight reindeer past the moon in a starry winter sky. <laughs> and so next um, I'm going to read an ancestor poem, it's called Great Grandmother, and this is um, 
about, uh, about Mariam Gertrude Peckham, one of my father's grandmothers who, um, who was born in 1846 and died in 1914. Um, my cousin Jeannie, who's also descended from Mariam Gertrude Peckham, is here. So, great-grandmother. In autumn, she picked apples, packed the good ones in barrels, and husked corn on the back porch, storing some for winter fodder, grinding the rest for Johnny cake. She piled yellow pumpkins in the cellar while the children gathered walnuts, butternuts, and chestnuts, mostly to sell, but plenty to eat. Sweet cider, which filled her china pitcher through the fall, was kept for vinegar when it started to work. On snowy nights, Mariam sat at her desk and wrote that women should wear pants in public, attend the universities, and vote. It was often after midnight when she went upstairs to the room where Henry was sleeping under a star-patterned quilt. He'd wake when she crawled in. Splinters of moonlight pierced the shutters, clattering and wind. In March, snow melting, Henry tapped the maple trees and took the sap inside for Mariam to strain and boil down. She sold her articles to magazines, sewed for neighbors, and ran a millinery shop, all the while dreaming of a world where women could enter any profession. Mm -hmm. She told Henry, and he nodded as she tacked a red silk rose to a hat. Wow. <laughs> Um, my mother was descended from, um, from both the Mayflower Pilgrims and from the Wampanoag Indians who helped them survive in Plymouth, especially uh, that went the first winter, but also long after. Uh, so now I'm going to read a few poems about uh, some of my mother's ancestors. And the, the first one is called Elizabeth Contemplates Her Will. And this is about Elizabeth Tilly Howland, who was born in 1607 and died in 1687, and the poem is in her voice. And she came over on the Mayflower when she was 13 years old. 13 years old, I survived 65 awful days under the leaking deck of that stinking ship, where people's gums bled and breath reeked, teeth wobbling in their mouths. John fell into the sea during a storm, but luckily was hauled back on board. My parents, aunt and uncle, endured the trip, only to die that first winter in Plymouth. Three years later, I married John. We had ten children, and I helped him plant fields of wheat and corn. Now he's gone, and I must decide which of my children and their children, who number 88, We'll get Mr. Tyndale's works, Wilson on the Romans, my sheets and pillow beers, rugs and blankets, iron pot and pot hooks, brass kettle, cupboard, and irons, chess, trammel, and land with the meadow. Who will read my great Bible and small one? Who will sleep in my feather bed, feed my sheep, wear my linen and woolen clothes? use my pans to bake their bread. So my mother was born Evelyn Ellis Bumpus in Cushnet, Massachusetts in 1911. Uh, her father was Ebenezer Ellis Bumpus, and he was a direct descendant of Edward Bumpus, who came over on the fortune, the first ship after the Mayflower. He, Edward Bumpus was um, a Huguenot. He was a, a French religious dis dissident, and his original name was Edouard Bonpas, but he became Edward Bumpus in Plymouth. <laughs> and this is about him and his wife, Edward and Hannah Bumpus. When Edouard Bonpas got to Plymouth in 1621, the other pilgrims called him Edward Bumpus, but why complain after long weeks at sea on the fortune? and reaching a continent with no king or pope, where the land was almost free. At first he planted Indian style, in circles like small volcanoes, three feet apart with corn seeds at the center. 
When he'd saved enough, he bought an oxen plow, planted wheat and barley in long straight rows like an Englishman to sell to newcomers up north in Massachusetts Bay. Hannah kept a garden where she tended peas, cabbages, radishes, carrots, garlic, onions, melons, artichokes, skirrets, and leeks. She bore 12 children in a house built around a great brick chimney. There wasn't much to do in Plymouth but work and pray. So if the family members weren't always dutiful, who could blame them? Except, of course, the preachers and magistrates who ordered son John publicly whipped for idle and lascivious behavior, <laughs> Edward Jr. for striking and abusing his parents, a lenient punishment because he was crazy-brained. Mm -hmm. A narrow winding staircase ascended from the entry hall to the chamber where Hannah made love with Thomas Bird in her 55th year until they too were caught and whipped. Wow. Edward Sr. took her back, and she set violets and daffodils among the onions for her 48 grandchildren to pick, intermixed lilies and daisies with parsnips, and stitched a new dress. Uh -huh. And then, as I said, my mother was also descended from the Wampanoags, but she never knew them because her mother, who was half Wampanoag, uh, her, her, the mother's mother died when my mother's mother was 10 years old, and then my mother's mother was adopted by um, a Caucasian couple, and so it, it cut off the, the family from their Wampanoag heritage. But I, after my mother's death, I wanted to meet the Wampanoags, so I went, I called the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe in Mass Massachusetts and said I wanted to come meet them. And I did that in 2012, and when I got there, the first thing anyone said to me was, Welcome home. And, and so I wrote a poem about that called Welcome Home. <laughs> Welcome home to Mashpee where snapping turtles and painted turtles bask on logs in the marsh, amid water willows, ferns, and pickerel weed with purple flowers reaching up from the shallows. Welcome home to the place where your great-grandfather whispered to trout he caught at Santuit Pond, then sat in a circle and offered his pipe to earth, sky, and the four directions. Welcome home to the coast where your ancestors built Wituash and gathered cranberries, to the woods where they hunted turkey, deer, and bear, and to the clearings clad in goldenrods and asters where they danced for 10,000 years. Welcome home. The elders have been waiting for you. Listen to their drums, the beat of your own heart. Take this wampum necklace made from the sacred shell of the Quahog clam. When you wear it, walk through red root and wild lupin. Hear the quickening rhythm of the field sparrow's song. So in, in addition to having poems about ancestors in this book, as I said, there are poems about my contemporary family, and that includes my grandchildren. Uh, three of whom are here, and so I'm going to read some grandchildren poem now. I've been watching you. <laughs> and this is, the first one is called Boy at Pinball for Brandon. He's nine years old in this poem, but he's now 16. Blonde and brown-eyed, almost nine, he leans in and tries to hit the flipper just in time to shoot the ball back over the waves to the sea witch's face amid the clinks and bells of dozens of machines lined up at the pinball museum. He's interested, but not swept away by these antiques. The game lacks the complications of Pokemon, the thrill of a Skylanders battle, the smack of a soccer ball. But he braves it long enough to rack up points on the back box. His grandfather, slender and 17, played avidly at Rosie's Diner, while I sat on a round red stool as he pulled the plunger and steel balls zipped through the maze, poison ivy blasting on the jukebox, he always won a replay. 
<laughs> the boy tries other machines. Red and green pop bumpers light up as the ball bounces off them. Bells ring, points scored. He takes aim, but misses the gobble hole, and the ball careens toward the drain. Gone, like all teenage dreams. <laughs> and the next one is called Names of the Horses. It's for Sabine at six, and Sabine is now 14. I want to remember the names you gave the little plastic horses, the females Sandy and Buttercup, the males Lightning and Gray, and how they ran in pairs through the canyons and mountains of the house, two in your small hands, your hair pulled back in a long blonde braid, two in my own grandmotherly hands, following close behind on the trails that led to the alpine meadows of the upstairs bedrooms, then down to the valley where they bathed in a stream rushing through the playroom in the basement. <laughs> Back upstairs at the ranch in the living room, they ate hay, and I watched as you lovingly bathed them again and gave them new shoes, each in his or her turn, before they took off for another expedition through the wilds <laughs> of the house. And when they reached that stream in the basement again, I spread a blanket on the sandy shore and lay back, exhausted, to watch you play. <laughs> <laughs> and third grandchild, Autumn the girl. Autumn is the only one who isn't here. She's on a Girl Scout field trip today. So, and this is a sonnet that takes place when Autumn was four, and, uh, and Autumn is now 12, and she'll be 13 this month. So, Autumn the girl. Autumn Rose makes hoopos whoop in me, daughter of my daughter four years old. She draws fairies and writes poetry about the queen of water. She told us this kind monarch also rules the day. In cartoons, she scorns mean clouds and monsters who snarl or roar, preferring bears who play fair with friends and mice who become dancers. <laughs> Yet she speaks knowingly of pterodactyls and getting good jobs with an MBA. <laughs> she, she doesn't shy away from things like fractals at the science center high above the bay, which shines like metal as the sun goes down, and she proclaims, the queen has on her crown. <laughs> okay. okay, fourth grandchild. Easier. Naturalists. He's always been a naturalist. Um, so this is Naturalists for Devlin. He's two years old in this poem, but he is now nine years old. And he's still a naturalist. Two years old, he takes my hand, leads me to the blackberry vine growing on the fence in his backyard. They're not ripe yet, he explains, then points to a small hole in the earth. The ants live there. I need a digging stick, he announces, holding up a fragile twig and shaking his head. This one's no good. I hand him a thicker stick. Perfect. In a shady corner near the patio, he digs and makes a find. It's a roly-poly in a ball, he says. I hold out my hand to receive the woodlouse, a terrestrial crustacean. Gretchen and I called them pill bugs in first grade when we found them with ants and Jerusalem crickets. Careful, my grandson warns, a pincher bug. It will pinch you. He points to an earwig, an insect with cerci, forceps on its abdomen. It's had five molts before becoming an adult. Someday I will tell him this, and that females have straight pinchers, males curved ones. Today, though, he's the teacher and I'm his eager pupil, standing in light while blackberries ripen and a pill bug unrolls. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just going to read two more poems. Uh, they're both from this anthology that I co-edited, Fire and Rain, Eco Poetry of California, poems about California ecosystems. There are 149 contributors. And um, I'm giving all of the profits from this anthology to seven environmental organizations. 
So I'm going to read two of my own poems from the anthology. The first one is called Tracking. It's from the coast and ocean section of the book. And it takes place at Point Reyes National Seashore. Mm -hmm. A gray fox leaves its mark, twisted droppings on the trail. No silvery back or rusty flanks flash in lupin and coyote brush by the path, and no short barking yips ride ocean wind. In daylight, the gray fox hides in its den somewhere on the rocky declivity. But each four-toed imprint capped with claws like candle wicks, Says the gray fox walked here where irises and ice plant give way to dune grass holding sand in place. Far out on mud flats, another sign. Deep five toed tracks in player, pairs, right rear foot, plantigrade by left front, means none other than raccoon out in the dark at low tide for the day's first shellfish and insect pickings. Triangular marks crossing raccoon tracks say black-tailed jackrabbit after succulent grass on the islands on the flats where I stop to eat and make plaster casts. Tennis shoe prints leading back to the dunes will be erased at high tide and I'll take my trash back to civilization, leaving only these words to trace the fact that I walked here, I ate. I sang. Thank you. And I'll conclude with a poem I'm going to recite from the Coastal Redwoods section of Fire and Rain. Um, it's called Muir Woods at Night. Rust-colored ladybugs clustered like grapes, mate on horsetails that wave by a creek where silvery salmon spawn and leap when the sandbar breaks at the gate to the sea. The ladybugs have come hundreds of miles from valley to coast for this single's bash. The females are choosy, they twiddle the males, seeking appendages padded with fat. And all around, high in redwood burls, on elk clover leaves and in the rich soil, the meaning of life is to stroke and prod under a humpbacked moon, dissolving in fog. for you from between the poetry space and the, the prose space that you were writing? Well, for, for me, um, poetry is more concentrated and more stylized than prose, and the language is in some way denser than it is in, in prose, so that, um, for example, in traditional poetry, if the language becomes stylized and condensed by using rhyme and meter, but there are a lot of other ways you can achieve that same density in poetry, and one way is to, um, to, get, is to work on the emotional impact of the poem, another way is to make it dense with images. It can also be dense with poetic language other than um, just rhyme and meter, it can be dense with assonance and literate, alliteration, with the repetition of sounds. Um, vowel sounds and consonant sounds. Um, 
It can also, you can also not only repeat sounds in poetry, but you can repeat whole lines, and that can make, a, a, make the, the impact, impact stronger. So, prose is more airy. <laughs> uh, what led you to poetry in the first place? Um, well, I started writing poetry when I was six years old. Um, when I was six years old and I was on my way from home from school in a, a wind, on a windy day, um, I started thinking about death and I didn't like the idea of dying. And I really liked poetry that my teacher, my first grade teacher, had been reading to me. And, and, I, and I felt, you know, like, what's, I, you know, I, I was six years old. I think there are a lot of points to life, but this, is my, this was my reading when I was six, uh, six. I thought, what is the point to life if we're going to die? And then I, I decided that if you can write it, you know, if you can communicate with people and write a good poem that will, po will possibly live beyond you, then you've redeemed your life. And so I, I, six. <laughs> so, I so I was six years old, and I went, went home and I immediately wrote a poem, and, uh, and I didn't think a poem from a child's point of view would cut it. And so I wrote a point of view that I thought I thought I was writing from the point of view of an older person looking back nostalgically at their childhood. And I still remember that 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 poem that went down in the hollow by the old oak tree in the hills of paradise. There the little birdies sing and swing in the trees above, down in the hollow of the old oak tree in the hills of paradise. And I and I even remember what I when. I first wrote Old Nut Tree, and I thought the old oak tree, the sounds were nicer, old oak, and um, so I changed it to Old Oak Tree. And then my first grade, I showed it to my first grade teacher, and she wanted me to read it to the class, but I wasn't, I was ready to write a poem, but I wasn't ready to, to read a poem to I wasn't ready for poetry reading, and so, so I did get up in front of the class at her insistence, and then I kind of looked down at my page and mumbled because it was so embarrassing to have to stand up and read my poem. Wow. So, and then I, my poetry, my interest in poetry continued. On in fifth grade, I fell in love with Emily Dickinson, and uh, the, her poem "Success" uh, was in my fifth grade reader. And so I thought, wow, I'd really love to be able to write a poem like that. Um, then in, when I was um, a teenager, I fell in love with the romantics, with, with Byron and Shelley and Keats and Burns in particular. Um, shall I keep going? I could talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> I really fuck up all the history that's, here. That's about, you know, it's a conversation kind of what, what you're interested in talking about, I'd like to hear. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, I'm certainly curious uh, about your preferences and what you like to read in poetry. Okay, so as a, in college I was a biology major and I only took one class in comparative literature and it didn't include um, poetry, so I didn't know anything about contemporary poetry, I didn't know anything about um, 20th century poetry, but I did find that Robert Frost and Edna St. Vincent Millay when I was in college, and I really started liking the, their poetry as much as their romantics. And I didn't know any, but they write rhyme poems. They write very, they wrote very traditional poetry. And so I didn't know anything about free verse poems or people who write it. But then when I was 24 years old and a graduate student in zoology, um, I joined the Berkeley Poets Co-op. And I started going to weekly um, poetry workshops, and there people talked about Wallace Stevens and T.S. Eliot, and um, they talked about Robert Creeley, they talked about Kenneth Rexroth, they talked about a lot of poets I had never heard of um, and didn't know anything about, and so I just started buying books and checking books out of the library and reading them, and I actually started doing more reading and poetry than I was doing in zoology, and the professor I was doing research for didn't like that very well. Um, but that was where, where my heart was at the time. And then, I started, and, and then I started falling in love with contemporary poetry. I was particularly taken by the confessionals, um, Robert, uh, Robert Lowell, uh, Sylvia Plath, and Anne Sexton. I loved the intensity 
of their language, and I loved, I loved the um, emotional, but you know, their, the emotional rawness, and I loved the narrative in their work. So, so they, that was very important to me. And then, because my background was in science, I found I started writing a lot of poems um, that have bio, biological imagery, a lot of biology poems, and also physical science poems, all sorts of, of science poems. And then I came across po other poets, including Patty Ann Rogers, who um, has actually blurbed two of my books, and who um, just won last year the John Burroughs Medal for Lifetime Achievement um, in, uh, in nature writing, nature poetry writing. And another one is Alison Hawthorne Deming, who is a, d a direct descendant of Nathaniel Hawthorne. And I like her poems very much, and I, I now know her too. I was influenced by uh, Robert Haas's first book, Field Guide. And now I read, I read all kinds of poetry. Even, you know, I read experimental poetry, I read traditional poetry, I read free verse, I read the moderns, I read the postmoderns. I, I really enjoy reading poetry. Wow. Did you have any thoughts on the uh, accessibility of poetry? Uh, there are those who want uh, poems to uh, speak to the average person. Uh, and those who are more interested in having something happen in, in the poem itself uh, uh, without regard to being that friendly to, uh, to the reader. Do you have any I, thoughts on that? I, can, I appreciate poets who are really into it for the language and finding a, a, a something new to do with language, but I'm more interested in communicating with people than in playing with, with language. So. If, you know, so if somebody doesn't understand a poem of mine or, you know, vastly misinterprets it, then I'm, I'm disappointed because, for me, communication is, is what it's all about. And, and writing poetry makes me feel closer to people because I'm able to share my thoughts, my feelings, my memories, and they know me better, and it's, and it's a, a wonderful experience. And if you write something, that people don't understand, that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of poets teach. Um, I know that you run the uh, science, Children's Science Museum. Yes, I down, did. Downtown yes, Berkeley, I, did I, I did. I did it for 17 years till it closed. Um, have you ever taught poetry? Um, no, I haven't ever taught. Well, I've taught single classes, like I've taught in some of my grandkids' classes. I've taught poetry workshops for kids. Um, I've done that a number of times. I've done a, I, I took uh, with uh, Chris Olander, who is now the Poet Laureate of Nevada County. At this April, I gave a, a workshop at the Sierra Poetry Festival. So I've done one shot, things like that. I've also participated in a lot of um, poetry workshops, not as the leader, but as a participant, and I enjoy um, commenting on, on on other people's poetry and giving feedback. That, and you're that, very that, good that, at that. that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and and I do exchange poems with friends, and I've done that with Marcia and Steve. I exchange poems with friends and and give feedback. Um, and somehow I feel like that is a, that it, that's an, enough. I like you know I've always enjoyed having a career um, where I was doing something other than reading people's poetry, uh, and where and that was give, always giving me information to bring other kinds of of things into my poems. Well, you have had a career of reading other people's poetry with your poetry. Yes, that's right. And um, that's, a, you know, that reading for whether you're going to publish something is a different energy from reading for just for pleasure. Or for, right, that's right. So do you have any thoughts on being a publisher? Yes. Particularly about poetry? I have strong thoughts on it. <laughs> <laughs> and the strong thought is that it's much more, I really, I, I love the poets, the poems, the collections, by individual poets that I've published, but I find it much more gratifying to publish an anthology 
mm -hmm. than to publish a collection by a by a single author, because the, you know it's just there's a community involved. There's a community involved in the in the, the, the readings. There's a community involved in promoting the book. Um, and there is, you know, in my latest one with 149 contributors, well, those are 149 happy people. <laughs> Whereas, when you're publishing books by individual authors, you can only publish like one in a hundred of the people who give you their manuscripts to consider, and so then you have a lot of unhappy people. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, you know, I I couldn't accept everybody, everybody, and I and I was, you know, and this isn't to say I would never publish a book by an individual author again, but I've just found it more gratifying to do the anthologies and. Because you can't publish it any everyone, some people particularly, you know, if it's somebody who knows you, they don't have to be a close friend, but somebody you've been to their readings, they've been to your readings, they they start thinking you're obligated to publish them. Mm. And I did have some people, you know, write send me hate mail and <gasps> nasty oh phone calls, and oh so it's it's amazing what can happen when you start when you have to reject people. Oh. Ouch. Glad I never applied to your question. Who's a friend? Some people would think, well, because, you know, I'm an independent uh, publisher, that is, if they can pay for the book, I'm obligated to publish it. Well, I didn't feel, I didn't feel that way at all. I would never feel that way. I would never publish a book, you know, just because somebody can come and give me the money to do it. It's the, the quality of the work and whether it speaks to me and whether I think it will speak to other people, that's important. Yeah, I've, I've uh, worked in, on uh, poetry magazines and had the back and forth uh, in the editorial conferences <coughs> about uh, what is going to end up taking up those pages and just because one person loves it doesn't mean it'll get the majority vote when you're doing that sort of thing. For for uh, one person, when it's your show, uh, you're representing that as your taste and as your you know getting behind it. You have to put a lot of your own energy into it. Uh, yeah, I will say though that in, in both of the anthologies, although I made the final decision myself about all of the books by individual authors that I published, um, I did have co-editors on both of the um, uh, anthologies, that the Scarlet Tanager anthologies that, uh, that I've put out. I've actually put out three anthologies and one was edited by Andrina Zawinski, so I had nothing to do with that, but this one and Red Indian Road West I co-edited and it's really good to have another pair of eyes and, and you know somebody else's perspective because I'm fallible. I can make mistakes. I can overlook a really good poem or I can like something and, and miss a spectacular flaw. <laughs> and, so, and so, you know, and so it's really, you know, it's good. Both, in both cases, both my co-editors and I both read everything and discussed everything. You included 149 poets in there. How many did you not include who are also possibility? Uh, yeah, there, we, well, we received probably, we received over 1,200 poems, so there were, there were at least twice as many <coughs> people who submitted. So in that case, it's, you know, you still have to do rejections when you're doing an anthology, but you can, you're, you're publishing more people in the book, you're making more people happy, and people don't seem to go to pieces. I've also worked on literary magazines as well as the anthologies, and people don't tend to go to pieces if they're rejected by uh, for an anthology or a literary magazine. Um, <laughs> they can let that go and move on to the, <laughs> submit someplace else. Whereas if you reject their book, you know, they might have a nervous 
nervous breakdown. <laughs> yeah, front, front world. Uh, uh, do you have thoughts on uh, getting your own work uh, out into the world? Um, I do, yeah. I've, I've published um, six full-length collections now and four chapbooks. And only one of those is with my own press, Scarlet Tanager Books. And that was another thing I, dis I discovered early on. I published my own collection, Wild One, in 2000. And I thought, oh, I can do this myself, just the way I want it. And I discovered that it was a very, very lonely thing to do to publish, publish my own book. It works for some people, but... For me, it wasn't as much fun as having it published by, an, by another press, even if it's another small press, be, because one thing, nobody is working with you on the design. You should kind of twist your friend's arms and say, which, which cover do you like better? And um, There's nobody who's, in, who's vested in it. There, nobody else is vested in proofreading it. And worst of all, and this is the, this is the biggest bummer of, of self-publishing, nobody else cares if you know about promoting the book mm -hmm. nobody else is going to set up a reading for you nobody's going to send it to reviewers for you um, nobody's it, nobody else is that excited about it <laughs> whereas when you, if somebody else publishes your book your publisher is is, is excited about it too mm. well uh, we're about the point where I ask the audience if they would like to participate in a discussion. And any thoughts come up that uh, you'd like they? to share? Yeah, um, I wanted to ask if you, in the Fire and Rain anthology, if you had an idea about those sections before you started, or if that came up in a, at a particular point in the editing? That's a really good question, and in, in fact, I got the idea for this anthology um, eight years ago, in 2011, and when I got the idea for the anthology, the, the idea came with the idea that it should be organized by the bioregions rather than by author or, or anything else. Um, or date when it was written, or uh, I because I had read two other eco poetry anthologies, um, and I thought there was something missing here, and and what was missing was something that was really focused around the ecosystems, and so I wanted to capture the California ecosystems, and so I I, I stuck with that, but it took a long time to find that to sort of hook up with the co-editor and to and to bring it together. So I got the idea in 2011, and the book finally came out in 2018. Yeah, Shirley. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I have your ancestor's book that you gave me a while back, and I feel like I'm rediscovering it, listening. I, I never heard you give a reading from it. Oh. And I, I'm sitting here thinking it's, my all-time favorite, and um, I'm interested, I can't remember this now, in the book, how did you find out about some of these really far back ancestors? Was it in your family being told about them, or, or did you go to great lengths to find out? That, that's a great, a great question. Um, one of them, the one about Miriam Gertrude Peckham, I got all of the details for that poem from a, a, a little self-published memoir that my grandmother wrote. My grandmother was one of her daughters, and my grandmother wrote a little book called Memory Lane um, to give to my father and his brother for Christmas one year. And so, I, you know, in, a, in reading, I thought, wow, this is, there's a poem here about my, about my great-grandmother. And so I pulled the, the facts from that. Um, for the Mayflower an ancestors and for Edward and Hannah, Hannah Bumpus, and there are, there are other historical poems too, um, it, it takes research, but because the, my ancestors included the, uh, the, the pilgrims of, of Plymouth Colony, um, you, there, it's easy to find information, like you can Google, enter in a Google uh, 
Elizabeth Tilly Howland will, and you can the actual will will, wow. will come up, um, which is very different from my poem, um, in in which I imagine myself in, into into her voice. Um, so, but again, that's you know I did that kind of thing to get the right facts, and I didn't I didn't make facts up for yeah. the historical mm -hmm. poems. For the Bumpus family to find out what they were doing in, in Plymouth, I, I, um, I, uh, first of all, to get details, I read a book called The, the, the Husbandman of Plymouth. And, and, then, uh, and also, to get the details of their transgressions, um, <laughs> I, I, I uh, did a search for the name Bumpus in the Plymouth court records. You can also get the Plymouth court records online and I can see what they did and what you know and what the punishment was. And and it's really it's it's very interesting for when Hannah Bumpus had the affair with Thomas Bird, he was whipped more times than she was because it was felt that she was um, a, she had been a virtuous woman and he had corrupted her. Wow. So that was the perspective on adultery that was mostly the man's fault, yeah. whereas throughout a lot of periods sure. of history and cultures, it's put on the woman. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Plus you visited and actually went there. Right? Yeah, I did. I, yeah, I actually went there, um, uh, there it, to Plymouth Plantation, which is a reconstruction of Plymouth Colony, and there are actors and, and actresses playing the roles of the of the pilgrims, and so you can go there and talk to your ancestors. How about the Native American? How did you find that out? How did I, I I found out about my Native American ancestry because the the story with of the Wampanoags, the, and he my, according to to my mother, he was a Wampanoag chief. But I haven't been able to verify that he was he was a, he was a chief. But um, her mother told her that her that her and it's, it was a story passed down mm -hmm. through little girls. Wow. So when her, you know her her mother's mother died at, at when when her when her my mother's mother was ten. Her mother, Anjanette Sampson, who had had the affair, the affair with the Wampanoag man, so sold her before she was ten years old. Your, your father was a Wampanoag chief, and so, and then she, in turn, died when my mother and my aunt Ethel were seven years old. But before, before she, before she died, and it was the same disease, pneumonia. Um, she told my mother and my aunt that their that their grandfather was a Wampanoag chief. And so then my mother and my aunt passed the information down to me. And I haven't been able to find, um, because in those days it was considered kind of scandalous. My, gra my, my uh, grandmother, who was born in 1881 and was half Wampanoag, it was, it was not okay to have a child who was half black or half Native American. And so that kind of thing got purged often from the, from the official records. And so I got my grandmother's birth certificate and her father's not listed. And my, when my grandmother was 10 years old, um, she was adopted. She was, she was adopted. She was adopted by a Caucasian couple. Her mother died. She, the mother and father hadn't been married. And I went to genea the um, ancestry.com and hired the genealogists there to try to identify my Native American great grandfather. Um, and they found my my grandmother's adoption records, but and uh, and I was able to apply to the court in Bedford, Massachusetts, and have my mother's my grandmother's adoption records unsealed. You would think after a hundred years, you don't have to apply to the to the court anymore and say why you want the information, but but I had to do that, and I did. And then even in the adoption records, her biological father was not named. Mm -hmm. wow. so, so, I have a comment. Okay. In contrast with how you did your research, my brother Eugene uh, and I have both visited the uh, cluster of, of very small towns in Abruzzo where all our grandparents came from. Oh. And the records, the place to go to the records are the churches there. 
the birth and death uh -huh. records. Oh. And he went back hundreds of years. And now he's in con with, you know, with all this communication, it impro improved uh, identification having to do with, with DNA testing and so forth. Um, uh, you can, you know, you, you submit your DNA and you get a list of... Right, and I've actually done that. I've done it and it, um, and I've also, again, as part of the same project with the Ancestry.com genealogists, had them try to use the DNA to identify the Native American branch of my family. There's a big problem in that the, um, most Native Americans don't get their DNA done because they they feel like it's they, intrusive, they, yeah. it's in, intrusive and it's right. to cast them out and say you're not Native right, American right. you're not 25 percent and so yeah. they don't want to go there sure. and I think that's perfectly valid but what they I do know a lot what a lot of my DNA relatives are and I came back being very close um, to descendants of my my great-grandmother's twin sister, my great-grandmother who had the affair with the Wampanoag man had an identical twin sister, and I'm very closely related um, uh, to, to some of her descendants, and it looks like um, her twin sister had an uh, affair with the same man. And that was her kids. And the Ancestry.com people thought that it, it, had, it must have been, the guy must have been the twin sister's husband. And so one of the twin sister's descendants had, the, you know, the DNA test Y chromosome. The, 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 the man's name was Frederick Bryant Peckham, my, my great-grandmother's twin sister's husband, and the son, who was no in descendants who were closely related to me, have the men have no Peckham DNA on their Y chromosome. So the man, the, the guy was not the twin sister's husband. Um, it was the, the Wampanoag mystery man. <laughs> I will say for him, this, the, my, the, um, the son that apparently was fathered by the same man was born about 12 years after my, gra my grandmother. And it was after, after my great-grandmother, it was after my great-grandmother's death. So my great-grandmother is Anjanette Sampson, affair with Wampanoag, man, baby girl, my grandmother. 12 years later, after she dies of pneumonia, he had he has an affair with the identical twin sister, and now I'm, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm and they, they and and she has a son with him, and they and presto, I have a, I have a lot of very close relatives on that side of the family. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta be a in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, there are lots. There, there's the yeah. Why did not there's all of that? There's the in the book. There's more in becoming an ancestor, but I found out much more about this after I wrote the book. So, mm -hmm. so it's not all in the book, but some of it. Volume two. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is, it's, it's, you know, it's like a 19th century soap opera. Right. <laughs> uh, thoughts on working with it in prose? Um, yes, I have thought about that. I have thought about it, but I haven't, I, I haven't started doing it. Um, I did write an uh, essay, um, a personal essay called uh, All Life is a Circle, and, that, and it was about the quest to, to find my Native American great-grandfather. Uh, anyone else would like to saw a hand go up? Yeah, Brandon. Um, did your interest, was, or was your interest in ancestry inspired at all by your poetry, or did you just kind of like realize that you enjoyed being an ancestor and then Figure, find out that um, poetry kind of went well with that. Like, was it completely independent, or did no? I I think that um, my I was interested in in ancestry, and I've I've always been interested in knowing you know who, who my parents' ancestors are, and and that spurred me to to write about it, to want to um, to respond to what I know about it in, in poetry. Yes. Um, did you, when you were a member of the uh, Berkeley Poets Co-op, did you know, or did you learn anything about uh, 
craft that um, has stuck with you um, throughout the years? And if so, what, what were some of those? Um, we learned a lot of things. Yeah, we learned, that's where I learned about craft. I mean, because at that point, I subsequently uh, earned degrees in English and creative writing, as well as my science degrees. But it was, that was in the Berkeley Poets Co-op where I first had the experience of looking at every word and getting rid of unnecessary adjectives, getting rid of unnecessary articles and adverbs, and, and it's this, um, in this process of condensing the work and, and getting down to the essence of, it, of what you want to say and not, not having all of the extra baggage. And also, we, we worked on line breaks, we worked on images, uh, we, we worked on things like when mixed metaphors work and when you really you know, can't do that and need to stick with the original metaphor. Um, we just worked, when we talked about things like, you know, when the uh, assonance and alliteration are good and they're working and when it um, becomes too much. So we just all aspects of, of craft. Others over on the side? Or? Well, we're wrapping up, um, and uh, I very much appreciate your having come in, but you wanted to add, end with a couple of poems. Yes, I wanted to read two poems for, for the conclusion, so okay, shall I do that? Yes. Okay. And I think first, I want to read Becoming an Ancestor, the title poem of this book, Becoming an Ancestor. According to the dictionary, I'm not an ancestor yet, only a grandparent of a blonde boy who clomps in his new sandals, then throws me a ball strewn with black stars and moons on a white background, and a bow-legged baby girl with blue eyes, all smiles today in her hooded carrier, a child born the day my own grandfather would have turned 130. He never knew he had grandchildren, let alone great-greats. My own toddler days of warm cookies, crayons, and Betsy Wetsy dolls don't seem that far away, but I am en route to becoming an ancestor. Mm -hmm. Lucy and Ricky are dead. Barbie is past 50. Even the hippies are history. <laughs> when my grandchildren show their grandchildren my photo in an old album, I wonder what they'll say that I swore like a trucker when I was hurt, <laughs> blew like Vesuvius when I was mad. They might recall I was always late, never learned to knit or crochet, had brown hair, couldn't cook worth a damn, but could carry a tune, <laughs> took poetry books everywhere, liked to know birds and insects by name, overreacted in both bad and good ways, was unreasonably vain for someone my age, <laughs> had legs like a crane, and liked to dance. <laughs> Thank you, and I'd like to conclude with a, um, a poem for my husband, Richard. It's a villanelle. I started with a villanelle, so I thought I'd end with a villanelle. Um, when Richard and I got married in 2002, we agreed to write love poems to each other using the then recent scientific finding that if you put the universe into a box and looked at it from a distance, it would be beige. And this was a big disappointment to a lot of people because it had originally been reported that the universe was turquoise. Oh. But apparently there was a glitch in the computer program that showed it was turquoise and in fact it was beige. And so um, we didn't show each other our poems to, until our wedding, um, but uh, unbeknownst to each other, we both wrote villanelles, and we both started with the same quote from the New York Times, which is, the universe is really beige, get used to it. <laughs> and, and, and that's from John Noble Wilford. So I, we, we took that as a, um, e evidence that we were truly meant for each other. So, this is Color of the Universe for Richard. I can't believe the universe is tan, not red or green or lavender or blue. I feel carnelian when you take my hand, not beige like lima beans from a can. 
but a splendid electrifying hue. I can't believe the universe is tan. Rose and gold are what I understand when I think of waking up each day with you. I feel carnelian when I take your hand. And like the universe, my love expands, surrounding us with turquoise and chartreuse. Can you believe the universe is tan? A color desolate as lunar sand and homely as a peanut or cashew. I feel carnelian when we're hand in hand, listening to Pariah play Chopin. The stars all turn cerulean on cue. I don't care if the universe is tan. I feel carnelian as you take my hand. I'm happy to say that uh, Lucille Langday has brought her books, and they are for sale. I hope that you will take advantage of that opportunity. And I hope you'll also take advantage of the opportunity that our, her books are in our a library collection and uh, make use of your library. Um, <coughs> I run two poetry programs besides this one here at the branch. Uh, I do a monthly poetry circle where people on the second Thursday of the month just sit around a table and read poems to each other, very casual, very simple. And the next poet will be in February. Uh, it would be Rebecca Radner for the Clearly Wood series. Thank you again. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you.